Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're so excited to have you here joining us. Um, today, we're really excited to talk about the key factors of cybersecurity and privacy in the Internet of Things. Um, I'm Natalie Farabini, the marketing strategist here at Optigo, and this is our CEO, Ping. Hi, Natalie. Thanks, Hello, everyone. Everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity in the Internet of Things. Specifically, we're going to be looking at considerations for managing IoT and this paper by the National Institute for Science and Technology. We're not associated with the National Institute for Science and Technology. Uh, we're just big fans of their work, um, and especially this paper that they did, um, which you can also download for free. Um, I'm sharing a link with you all now. Um, Feel free to dig into that paper. Uh, we're going to be giving you the Cliff's Notes version. Uh, I would say it took us each of us like two hours or so to get through it. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and and those who are interested, uh, NIST does an incredible job around cybersecurity. They have yeah. uh, a, a cybersecurity framework for those who are not familiar with. Uh, you should take a look at it. Even just the the overview of it, uh, it talks yeah. about kind of five aspects to a cybersecurity framework. Yeah. Uh, and then they have a couple of guys are quite good, really popular in the industry. And then this one really caught our attention. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that uh, on the subject of the cybersecurity framework, that is a framework that we've used to translate to, into operational technology in the past and, and take the pieces that might be more applicable to IT, but can also apply to OT. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. So today we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to define the Internet of Things, uh, make sure we're all on the same page there, uh, cover some cybersecurity and privacy goals, how cybersecurity for OT is different from IT, uh, we're going to share some cybersecurity considerations and a few of our own recommendations, and then we'll have time for questions. And just uh, in case uh, there's anyone that's not familiar, the term OT is operational technology. Yeah. Uh, I think based on the survey, I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar yeah. with that. But, uh, just to be definitely. Okay. So defining the Internet of Things. Um, the Internet of Things is, is a fairly broad term. Um, I wouldn't say that there's any one singular definition. We see different definitions for it all over the Internet, all over the place. But the way that we're going to be explaining it today is basically the operational technology that a lot of us are already used to. Uh, and it's now all smart and connected and collecting data and allowing us to better understand the environment and the way that people use it. Yeah, one one way, I, one term I, I heard someone say I really like is it's basically dumb things made smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, not, to, not to say these things were not important, yeah. but there were really little intelligence in them. Yeah. And uh, IoT is often associated with being connected, mm -hmm. um, but probably more importantly is that there's there's intelligence now and yeah. there's, there's likely some form of operating system yeah. is connected to some kind of network and it has some form of software part of it. Yeah, yeah, well said. Okay, so cybersecurity and privacy goals. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, um, so just to review quickly, um, the when it comes to cybersecurity and, and privacy risks, uh, in, in all aspects, but in IoT especially, especially, we can break it down into three main categories. The device security, data security, uh, uh, and, and personal identifiable information or ind individual's privacy. Um, device security is, you know, can you hack into it? Can you use that device to uh, uh, create an attack or can you attack the device itself? Um, the data security is the data that it, it creates. So a security camera is a video stream, a mm -hmm. uh, thermostat will be the set points or, or um, the temperature sen sensors and things like that. And the privacy, uh, sorry, the, what we call PII, personal mm -hmm. identifiable information, or individual's privacy, will be information that's, that's personal to a, a person, right? Mm -hmm. So email address, you know, very often you use an email address to sign in. Uh, there may be a location mm -hmm. in, information in it, or or much more than that. It could be you know facial recognition. It could be bi biometrics. It could be passwords. It can be credit card information. Yeah. Um, so those are the three main categories of cybersecurity and privacy. Risk. Yeah. And on sorry, going back no. um, on device security. So just to go back over that, um, you want to make sure that your devices can't be hacked to attack other devices. Um, that it's not eavesdropping on network traffic or compromising other devices. With data security, um, you're looking to preserve the data's um, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. 
So confidentiality, only those who are authorized can access it. Integrity, it's not being altered between where it's sent and where it's received. And availability, you can access the data whenever you need to. And as you said, with protecting individuals personally identifiable information, um, you just want to make sure that you're not compromising the information that you are collecting about other people or from other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just a few examples. So device mm -hmm. security, um, there was a an attack called Mirai, which is uh, probably mm -hmm. two years ago. Yeah. Uh, it went out there and it found uh, hundreds of thousands of security cameras and turned mm -hmm. them into attackers mm -hmm. and attacked DNS servers uh, that took down webs very, very important serv services like Google and Facebook. Yeah. Uh, Maybe not Google. I think Facebook definitely was impacted. I think Twitter was one of them. Yeah. Um, so that's the protecting the device itself, right? Yeah. Protecting your home, locking your doors, locking your windows. Yeah. Uh, data security is that information is creating or using. Mm -hmm. um, if it can be intercepted and, and leveraged, can it be modified to again be a middle middleman mm -hmm. uh, attacked? Uh, and then again, the identity, um, sorry, sorry, the personal information side, mm -hmm. which is a very very big topic now. Yeah. G GDPR, GDPR and, yeah. and uh, the California law, yeah. and things like that. And it's it's really interesting with those laws coming out. I think we've been talking more and more about cybersecurity for a few years now, um, but privacy and the data behind it and people's right to their own data is becoming more and more of a topic now. Yeah, and just to be clear, uh, privacy is not always associated with cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, us being technology folks, we talk much more about cybersecurity, but mm -hmm. privacy can be not technology oriented yeah. at all. Uh, and then this paper does show this Venn diagram where there's an overlap between privacy yeah. and cybersecurity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, so now, just breaking down those three uh, high level categories, um, what are some of the things we can do to mitigate the risk? Mm -hmm. So, if we want to protect a device, what are Thing, you know, general concepts to, to keep in mind for mitigating, for yeah. um, uh, uh, managing the risk of device security. Mm -hmm. So again, this document talks about four main aspects, uh, asset management. So know what you have. You know, yeah. If you think you have a thousand cameras, but you actually have- 2,000. 2,000 yeah. cameras, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's a pretty big problem. Yeah. Um, knowing what software it's running, yeah. knowing what firmware it's running. Uh, vulnerability management. So uh, now that software is a dominant aspect of most of the devices, mm -hmm. software is constantly being improved and very often not just for features and, and benefits, but very often it's because some form of weakness was found and the software was, was updated. So how do we manage that vulnerability? Uh, is there a database somewhere that every vendor puts in there? Uh, but the answer is no. How do you manage that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, access management. You know, you have an employee that left, and they have, mm -hmm. you know, the ones, the one username, password that everyone uses. How do you deal with that? How do yeah. you deal with the management, the access management to the device? Yeah. And do you know everyone who has access to your systems? You know, if if you had a few people who leave the company and you forget to update your passwords, but they still have access right. to devices and systems. This what way. does that mean? Yeah. 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 And then uh, the last is is a topic you'll see across, but uh, being able to detect when an incident happens. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, if someone was able to gain access to the device, would you know? Yeah. Uh, there's there's lots of data out there that takes you know x number of days, hundreds and hundreds of yeah. days before vulnerabilities are found and attacks are found. Um, what kind of system can we put in place to be able to detect? incidents that, yeah. that are important to that, that are related to device security yeah right? absolutely um so all of these are this is what no, we'll talk about firewalls we're talking about asset management software we're talking about spreadsheets yeah. how people yeah. use their information we're talking about uh, authentication servers um and lots of those exist in the it world mm -hmm. but the same tools may not be sufficient or may not be adequate yeah. when it comes to it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There might be a lot of visibility management software out there, but is it designed for OT devices that have very particular needs and, and might be quite different from IT? Yeah. So yeah. a couple of examples. In IT, um, IP scanners are very popular. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can scan a whole network and see what is connected, what is not connected. Mm -hmm. uh, and these scanners can be quite advanced, can tell you what is connected to the end through host names, through um, software versions and OS versions, things like that. 
but those tools may not work in an mm -hmm. OT environment, right? Yeah. These solar panels and thermostats and building automation control security cameras, are they responding to those uh, queries? They may not. Uh, and, you know, again, we're a company focused on smart building space. So uh, when we talk about IoT or OT networks and systems, we still keep in mind things are not IP, mm -hmm. you know, a, a backnet gateway that's bridging between IT, sorry, IP and mm -hmm. MSTP. These connected devices on the MSTP side are absolutely IoT devices. They absolutely are connected devices with intelligence on them. An IP scanner will not find them at all, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that's just one thing that this document is talking about, this publication is talking about that a lot of the IT methods and tools and process are very, very good, but they may yeah. not be adequate in a for IoT setting. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Okay. Okay, uh, the data. Again, yeah. data is the data that, that the device creates or consumes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when we talk about data protection, we typically look at um, how do we make sure that the data itself is protected? So through encryption, for example, mm -hmm. right? So if if a middle device, or a middle man, was able to capture that data, would they be able to understand what it says? If, mm -hmm. if you're sending over credit card information and someone in the middle was able to cache that information, could they decrypt it and, and see your credit card information? I yeah. uh, hope not. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, these are, you know, un unlocking doors. Uh, yeah. Opening opening fences, um, uh, setting the, the the cooling value of refrigerators yeah. and in pharma facilities. Uh, this is protecting the data. Uh, but number two is all, just as important is making sure the data actually does reach the other place. Yeah. Right? So you can protect it all you want. Yeah. The best way to protect it would be to not send it. Yeah, <laughs> it's in one place, it stays there all the time. But then you're not getting the use of it. That's yeah. that's right. Yeah. So. Uh, that's that's integrity, mm -hmm. right? Um, if it does reach to the side um, and someone modified it, mm -hmm. how can you know that it was modified? Yeah. How can you trust the data that's being transferred is correct, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, there's a lot of techniques for doing that. Um, th this is the concept of uh, how to mitigate that risk is looking at those techniques, right? And again, this publication talks about how some of the IT approaches may not be adequate, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a lot of IoT devices are not yet mature into cybersecurity, so they may not implement um, encryption. Yeah. They may not use strong encryption if they do. Yeah. Uh, they may all use a flat um, cipher, a, a, a code. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's multiple TLS versions or SSL versions, mm -hmm. um, and the reasons why there's different versions because there's vulnerabilities in the, in the lower ones, yeah. and especially now that computers getting faster and faster, if you're using weak encryption, someone really wants to break it, they'll they'll brute force it. Yeah, right, yeah. it's possible. Yeah, might just take time, but yeah. That's right. And then we have lots of lots of content out there that talks about the vulnerability. For example, Backnet. Yeah. Backnet is a wonderful protocol. It's used widely, and and we still encourage it. But mm -hmm. it is important for us in this context to understand mm -hmm. that data protection when it comes to Backnet, as mm -hmm. is today, uh, we have to look at protecting it not by encoding it or encrypting it because that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and then again, coming back to the first one is. If a breach did happen, mm -hmm. if a, if data was intercepted or data was modified, how can we detect that? Mm -hmm. Would you right. know? And how long yeah. would it take for you to know? Yeah. Yeah. And that probably would be much harder than yeah. protecting security at yeah. certain device. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right. yeah. And then, as we said, uh, a very very big topic is on the on privacy side, the yeah. personal information. Uh, there's a lot of text here, but really is how do you manage uh, how the information is being exchanged, who gets access to to what, and then again, how do you detect if personal identifiable information is intercepted, is modified, is uh, compromised. Yeah. Um, and this is where our governments are stepping in a lot. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's been big, yeah. especially in the last few years. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, uh, we we are in a world of digital. Mm -hmm. uh, our digital footprint is out there. And um, how do we make sure that we can minimize our footprint mm -hmm. um, or at least know who owns that data? Yeah. Um, so that you have the choice to change it, yeah. to revoke it. Um, 
and do things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so just to recap again, uh, there are three big cybersecurity and privacy goals here. Device security, making sure that the device itself is protected. Data security, making sure that the data is available to you and not to any person who walks up to a device um, and that its integrity is preserved. Um, and individual's privacy, protecting the personally identifiable information that you do collect from people or through, through the devices. And again, um, this document is wonderful. You don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, if you're really interested in this session, they have some some really good examples and, yeah. and breaking down. Uh, they have this whole table, oh, yeah. uh, you know, linking with the NIST cybersecurity framework and, and different different standards, uh, but also breaking down what is typically done in IT and how would it be different in OT. Yeah, yeah. So um, really good doc. Yes, so, so powerful. Um, we have a quick question that I think is uh, very relevant now. Do you think that building owners are even aware of their IoT data and who is responsible for their being informed on what data is collected and where, how it is transferred? Great question. Uh, great question. Uh, there's no blanket answer, unfortunately, for that. Mm -hmm. The topic of cybersecurity has been a really, really important topic for the past um, seven, eight years really important i mean it's it's in almost every trade show conference yeah. uh, small sales meetings uh, yeah. cybersecurity is a really really big deal but to answer his question uh, are the building owners aware um, i think the top owners are mm -hmm. very much mm -hmm. right uh, that the larger organizations are mm -hmm. um, but are they doing something about it that's a different question yeah. It is something I, in my personal opinion, I think everyone that's joining us are business people of some some form. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity will be one of those added value uh, as a product manufacturer, vendor, mm -hmm. um, as a service provider that will be a value added, allowing us to differentiate ourselves. But you know, probably in five years, this won't be a value added. It will be a requirement. Yeah, it'll be the standard, not the exception. That's right. Yeah, and. Um, Unfortunately, you know, right now it's a very, very big task, mm -hmm. and, and on, except for a few of the larger uh, building owners and building managers, they're not quite paying for it yet. Yeah. I, I certainly not saying that we should not be pushing for it. I think the floodgate is about to open, yeah. where these building owners will pay extra fees to make sure that you know the system integrator or consultant can talk the language of, you know, you're streaming this data. Let's make sure that we review it every X amount of time, or we get ex special permissions from the tenants, because that's another aspect yeah. to, to transfer their set points, their access control data, their CCTV data, yeah. uh, sorry, security uh, uh, security camera data. Um, so again, in short, not in general. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think most building owners uh, Maybe aware would be too hard of a word. I think they're aware, but are they really doing anything about it? No, I don't mm -hmm. think so. Uh, but I, I do really think in the next couple of years, it's going to be a really big value added for anyone in this industry, in our industry. Uh, and in five to 10 years, it will become yeah. a requirement. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And especially with the laws that have been coming out. I mean, GDPR a couple of years ago was a big one, but uh, the California Compliancy Privacy Act, if I have that right. I think so, yeah. Um, I think is even even bigger because I, I would say that it, it applies even more directly to the Internet of Things and buildings and the way that we're collecting data. Whereas GDPR, I think, um, was seen as a bit more of a marketing-focused privacy protection issue. California Compliance, where you, know, you can't have a standard password um, shipped on devices that you ship out even more applies to the Internet of Things, yeah. in my mind, yeah. yeah. I mean, this could be a whole topic for a yeah. kind of conference in the sense that, Ooh. for example, a set point that is being collected, who owns that? Like, who, yeah. whose data, who's yeah. the owner of that data? Is it the building owner? Is yeah. it the tenant? Is the person yeah. in that room? It's uh, very complex. I don't know what the answer yeah. is. Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot to untangle. Yeah. Um, Sorry, quick follow-up question to that. Yes. Um, part of the reason I ask is that we could be coming to a point where data is sold to an AHU supplier, for example, in order to help them gain sales leads. Very interesting. I think the evolution of data sales in the standard web. Yeah. So uh, to just to be clear, um, I just an excellent question, by the way. 
uh, I believe that the legal language will have to mature in the sense that what we're selling should not be selling the data, but selling the right yeah. to the data. Yeah. Uh, that's very, very different. So mm -hmm. if I am a building owner, my data is being collected by a service provider, um, uh, a heating ventilation provider, mm -hmm. and then that the heating vent ventilation service provider is selling it to a third party for, for good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, Technically speaking, the data should not be sold. It's the right to use the data that should be sold. Yeah. And what the, the big difference here is that me as a building owner, I can still revoke, yeah. the, I can still delete the data, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what this does is I can give permission, whether it's free or not, mm -hmm. to, for the data to be used. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's better not to sell the data. Yeah. So the change of ownership, yeah. that would be... Uh, and, and this this is one of the topics that that people need to understand. That mm -hmm. You should, whether it's in your personal life or in, in the smart building industry, you should own the data. Yeah. So the picture I'm putting on Facebook, I should be the one owning that. Yeah. I give Facebook to, the right to use it, mm -hmm. right? If um, I am a system integrator, I put a system together and I'm collecting data on energy usage, mm -hmm. the data should be owned by the owner of the building or the tenant of the building, depending in this case. And if I want to reuse that data for other purposes, yeah. we should be selling the rights to yes. it, not the data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's another thing with the CCPA is that uh, individuals have the right to say, I don't want you to sell my data. Um, it, it's putting the ownership back in the hands of the individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Hopefully that answered the question. If not, yeah. you know, follow up with us. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we should move along. Sure. We'll we'll get to more questions maybe at the end. Um, so cybersecurity for OT is different from IT. Huge topic and the really meaty focus of this paper. Um, there are a lot of differences between IT and OT, but three core differences that we're going to dig into. Uh, first, the Internet of Things devices interact with the physical world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cool, that's a hefty topic in and of itself. Um, but that basically means that, um, you know, the, the heating ventilation system in this room affects us physically. Mm -hmm. um, but you also get into safety and security issues like fire alarms or security cameras. These are very physical world uh, devices um, that are now being affected by software and um, could be hacked. Yeah. Again, if you look at the publication, uh, one thing that's very clear is uh, they define an OT device that a device that has sensors, mm -hmm. so collecting data or, or interacting with the physical world by reading something from the physical world, and actuators being able mm -hmm. to, to make a change to the actu yeah. to the physical world. Uh, in IT, uh, there are no interaction with the physical world, mm -hmm. right? A accounting software is purely digital. Yeah. So if I hack in the accounting software, really, really bad. Yeah. yeah. But I cannot impact the physical world. Yeah. But if I if I access I gain access to a access control device, mm -hmm. if I gain access to a heating ventilation system, mm -hmm. if I gain access to lighting control systems, mm -hmm. I can interact with the physical world. Yeah. I can read what the physical world is 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 um that's behaving. That's behaving yeah. Yeah. And I can change the physical world. Yeah. Uh, you know, one easy example I give all the time is uh, a thermos in the bathroom. Yeah. Right? I mean, you will have one. Mm -hmm. It is there. Yeah. It's connected. Yeah. Um, and anyone who goes into the bathroom can access has, it. Has yeah. access to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I, I think, one really almost by definition the primary difference between yeah. OT and IT. And, and, and knowing that is important. Uh, for creating your policies and process and your yeah. thinking around cybersecurity for IoT. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and by the way, very quickly, because there's a physical presence in the world, physical security, whether it's an alarm, intrusion, yeah. uh, surveillance, uh, it's a it's a couple couples very yeah. well with cybersecurity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You think about if somebody's able to hack your security cameras and take them down, and then they're able to. You, do something dangerous in the space, but it's not recorded. You know, yes, it's so it's so intrinsically in, uh, embedded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And also because there's physical uh, entity in, in real life, you know, putting a fence, putting a box, yeah. blocking it uh, goes a long way. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, next up, big uh, OT IT differences. 
Um, there's the ability to access, manage, and monitor IoT devices. Uh, we touched on this before, but there's not always the software available to us now to access and manage and monitor our OT devices. You mean all the security cameras, those do exist. But because those devices often connect to additional secondary sensors, actuators, external uh, devices, um, those are still really important when it comes to asset management. But how, what kind of tools do we use? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if we bring it back to the building automation space, if you can query all your controllers, that's great. But if each of these controllers are connected to additional IOs, mm -hmm. um, are those IOs important from a cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, plan policy? Uh, if it's not to you and you mm -hmm. choose that's not, that's okay. But mm -hmm. if you choose that, it's important for you to know that no sensors is offline, no sensors, no IO it has been compromised, yeah. removed. Um, those tools are much harder to find. And then the second thing that this publication talks about is that even if there are tools out there, mm -hmm. There's, um, from an IT standpoint, there's not one place you can go to mm -hmm. manage it. So it becomes much, much harder to do. Yeah. Uh, and if your IT counterpart, your IT peers are the ones who are responsible for cybersecurity and they don't have access to the tools, then they can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, do we, were we? Well, we lost audio briefly, but I, I think we're okay. good. I've gotten confirmation from somebody that we're, uh, you can hear we're us live. again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so sorry if you missed a little bit of that, but basically, yes, we we were talking about um, black boxes uh, being kind of the standard in this industry, um, but they don't always work for this new age of Internet of Things. That's right. Yeah. And just pointing out the difference between the IT space being really mature and those yeah. tools are widely available and those are not in yeah. the IT space. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and third and finally, um, IoT devices, uh, cybersecurity, and privacy feature limitations. So even when we do have the software available to us, um, they might be quite limited in what we can do to um, protect uh, our devices and detect when uh, a, a vulnerability does happen. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's basically saying, um, Again, it's, it's pointing out the uh, immaturity of mm -hmm. the space. Uh, and we don't mean that in a bad way, it's, it's just a new new industry. Uh, but things like username and password, those should be standard now, mm -hmm. but a lot of the devices don't uh, enforce password changes, don't mm -hmm. enforce a level of password. Uh, and worse, uh, and more importantly, if you were to do this right, you wouldn't be using the username and password. Mm -hmm. You will use some kind of certificate. And that's still relatively rare in, in the IoT space. Um, and be able to have management tools to make sure that everything is secure, mm -hmm. that, that you can do a blanket change uh, of all the policies. Yeah. And those are, are not mature. And on the privacy side, again, in the IT space, it's fairly mature to be able to say, I don't want to share this data, I don't want to share that data. Yeah. But in the IoT space, that might not even be possible, yeah. right? Can you set up a camera to say, I don't want to capture faces part of my uh, yeah. streams? That's, you know, it's that's complicated. It's complicated, complicated yeah, for sure. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Access control systems, right? I mean, you can identify a person by their badge. Yeah. Uh, what if someone getting in access to that? You know, all these things. So that's, yeah. that's still relatively new in terms of topics. Definitely, especially with. Um, the lack of access and monitoring and management that we have in our a lot of our operational technology devices, yeah. as we covered. Yeah. Okay, so some cybersecurity considerations. Um, one of the uh, big things that the NIST paper really drove home and emphasized was that cybersecurity, as many of you know already, is an ongoing journey. It's not a one and done process where you can set up some firewalls and VLANs and be done and okay, call it a day. Um, you always want to be learning about and understanding the risks and challenges, uh, adjusting policies and procedures, and implementing updated practices. And that's just kind of an ongoing process forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And one thing to hear to uh, what they're talking about is that 
uh, you start small, but also understanding how the devices are being used. And that, not, that might change yeah. as you have more tenants, as you have more people, or as you're moving a door around or a wall yeah. around. And, and it's kind of going back to reassessing your cybersecurity privacy yeah. as, as risks. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, a few considerations. First up, understand which devices have Internet of Things connected capabilities. Um, if you don't, as, as we covered it with access management, um, or asset management, sorry, uh, you can't protect what you don't know you have. You mm -hmm. can't protect your connected devices if you don't even know they're connected. Um, so know what those Internet of Things capabilities are. Uh, what kind of data is it collecting? Is it collecting data at all? Is it um, just responding to data that's being collected elsewhere? Um, so understand what that device is doing on your network and in the built environment. Uh, consider the environment. So as we talked about, you're going to have a thermostat in the bathroom. Who has access to that? Um, what implications would there be if somebody accessed that thermostat and hacked the system? Um, and also consider how that device behaves in the environment. So security cameras or access, access control systems, if it's protecting a highly critical area of your building that you don't want anyone to have access to, um, what are the implications if somebody does get access? Um, assess the risks based on the full context of the IoT devices. So the environment, how the device behaves in the environment, um, what kind of capabilities it has, plan ways to mitigate those risks, um, how would you respond in the event of uh, a vulnerability if you identified one, and uh, determine how to respond to risks. So one thing that Stockman did really well was uh, give, give some guidelines on how to think about it. So mm -hmm. you look at all your type of the devices that of devices you have. You have cameras, you have building automation systems, you have lighting systems, you have mm -hmm. solar panels, so energy systems, whatever it is, digital displays. And then uh, is there one general policy you can create around mm -hmm. each of these type of devices, um, how to handle them? And then you want to start looking at where each of these devices are used. So a um, air handling unit, if it's on a rooftop, and it's not accessible by anyone, it's very different than an air handling unit that's in the backyard uh, with a light, you know, mm -hmm. wire fence around it. Yeah. Uh, those two may be the same, make a model, maybe the same software, but because of where they are used, but who has access to them, the, the, the policies, the cybersecurity policies would have to be very different. Yeah. Right. Um, one example that we're giving is if you have a controller that's deep inside the plant and you have, you know, uh, doors after doors and, and you have fingerprinting and yeah, you have yeah. security guards. Yeah, and iris scanners. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, your plan for that control. Um, okay, so we have a few recommendations as well. Um, and I think uh, where uh, NIST considerations are a bit more um, high level, big picture thinking about your strategy and building out policies and procedures if you don't already have them. These are a bit more on the ground things that you might be able to do today. Mm -hmm. So first uh, up. Yeah, so first up, and again, the document does talk about this, mm -hmm. is segmentation, yeah. isolation. Um, it, it's still, it's, it's a very, very basic, very rudimentary approach, but one of the most effective one mm -hmm. is to separate your, your, your devices, right? Yeah. Or your application, your services, especially the high sensitivity uh, sensitivity from the low sensitivity. Yeah. The, the, the services and applications that have um, uh, different type of people touching it. You may mm -hmm. have certain services and applications that are accessible by many, many subcontractors. Yeah. Uh, and you would likely, in that case, want to segment that from information that is not accessible, that should not be accessible by them. Uh, so techniques would be you know, VLAN and subnetting, um, creating completely separate networks. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, we do have incredible cellular coverage now. Yeah. Um, I know often we don't like it because it means that we have new doors created mm -hmm. from a cyber standpoint. But there are situations where that is uh, that is the right thing to do, is yeah. to just completely seg segment and segregate it and then allow them access into the rest of it through VPN or cloud connections or of some sort. Yeah. So that one is just looking at your different services, your different peop uh, the people who, are, who need access to them, and building walls, building yeah. um, isolations between these different application services. Yeah, absolutely. 
um, black box devices. I know that they're very standard in the industry, but they don't offer visibility or management or monitoring that um, really is becoming more and more necessary. So we would recommend not upfront um, opting for a cheaper upfront cost and going with something that will offer you more troubleshooting and cybersecurity uh, capabilities. Yeah, and that, that includes if you are using um, DSL cellular connections, mm -hmm. uh, you, you find a way to able to monitor that, right? Mm -hmm. Know how many of them you have. Know that they are still online, that yeah. the bill has been paid and therefore it's being accessed. Uh, be able to see who has access to what, uh, yeah. when, how much traffic is creating, yeah. what type of traffic you can. I mean, it doesn't have to go to that extent, but uh, the idea of visibility is mm -hmm. is going to be very, very important. Not from a, just from a cybersecurity mm -hmm. standpoint, but also operational. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have so many devices now yeah. that uh, if you can't see them, yeah. you likely have problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if to secure that device, you have to be coding and CLI to do anything. Like that just adds time to trying to secure your devices That's and correct. keep them working. Um, another recommendation, try to implement policies that are simple enough that your your the people at your organization will actually do them. Um, I think one of the issues we've seen in recent years is that a lot of cybersecurity hacks happen uh, just out of human error. And that's okay, we're all human, but if you're implementing policies that um, your staff know what to do in the event of a vulnerability, they know to have secure passwords, uh, back things up in the cloud so that if you are hacked, the device might be affected, but you have the information you need to keep on going, um, that will make a big difference. I don't think that you know our cybersecurity policies need to be totally rocket science, uh, if it's simple that people simple enough that people will do them, that's the biggest start. Yeah, and I would say the the number one place to start is is talking cybersecurity with your team. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first thing you should tell them is if you find out and you're aware of some kind of vulnerability, even if it's your fault, please bring it up yeah. and no one be punished for it. Yeah. I think that's a very important in, um, uh, discussion and and. and information to give to your staff mm -hmm. so that if they did accidentally uh, leave their password somewhere, if they did accidentally give, give access to the wrong person um, that created a cybersecurity incident, mm -hmm. um, that they don't feel like they're going to be punished. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because if, if they do, they just won't say it. Oh, exactly, yeah. And it's worse if you delay finding out because somebody's worried that they'll be punished. Yeah. Um, for sharing that information. Better to just get the information and move forward. Correct, yeah. Um, and finally, test and review software before you update your devices, but do still update your devices <laughs> when there are software patches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this is actually, again, I think the, the publication does bring this up, how mm -hmm. um, there's an attitude often in the operational technology world that like, this is a critical system, yeah. it's working, don't touch it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it has merit in it because if we make changes and it crashes, it causes problems, then the cost is very, very high. Yeah. Um, the, the best practice now is to create a shadow system, a side test system. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to cost a lot, but you know, go to your customer, go to your, your, your vendor and say, can I get a couple extra products on the side mm -hmm. running the same thing we run in, in our whole building, in our whole city, whatever it is, uh, so that we can use it to uh, test new patches, mm -hmm. test new uh, programming, um, so that when we do roll it out, we reduce the risk yeah. of, of something going on. Absolutely, yeah, that's that's a very good point. They did cover that in the paper as well. Um, and yeah, as we discussed before, because operational technology, Internet of Things does affect the physical world, you have to be so careful about patching software updates and, and yeah, creating a shadow system, some sort of a digital twin so you can test things before you roll them out. Um, it's kind of like if you pull one block out of a Jenga stack and everything comes tumbling down, you want to just be very careful and make sure that everything is stable before you make any big changes. Yeah, and I'm going to warn everyone that the rate at which we will be updating software, it will increase yeah. significantly. Um, again, because cybersecurity is a big deal, yeah. uh, not only because, not, 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 for features and functionalities. Mm -hmm. you know, we used to release, every vendor used to release software primarily for new function, functions and, and features. Uh, I believe now we're gonna see um, 
a ratio of almost like five to, to one, 10 to one yeah. releases patches because of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Uh, and we should take advantage of that. You know, every vendor sells to many, many customers and mm -hmm. these customers will apply them differently, will find problems differently. So we benefit by, you know, crowdsourcing basically, yeah. right? Uh, vendor A sells to 10 customers, customer one finds an issue, all the other nine customers will benefit from a patch yeah. that customer A, uh, customer one found. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, very true. Okay, so in summary, uh, we're getting ready to wrap up this webinar. So if you have any questions, be sure to uh, throw, those, th throw those in the chat box. Um, but just to summarize, it's critical that we protect device security, data security, and uh, individuals' personally identifiable information. Uh, cybersecurity for OT and uh, connected OT devices, Internet of Things devices, is different than IT. Uh, it's not a simple copy-paste over solution can't just take the procedures that you have in IT and apply them to OT, in, not in all cases anyways. Um, you can improve your cybersecurity today by implementing some strong segmentation, VLAN, subnetting, maybe cellular connections if that fits your building and your system, opting for central ne centralized network management systems rather than um, a black box device that won't offer any visibility, developing simple cybersecurity policies that you know your staff will follow and having conversations with them about those policies and you know, having a bit more of an open dialogue um, and testing and reviewing software updates before you patch them through to your whole building system. Yeah, oh, we covered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if anyone was really interested in this topic, uh, this, this publication was very well done. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of details in it. You could probably skim through it in an hour yep. or two. Um, if you have any questions, reach out. We're no expert yeah. here. We're not in this. We're not associated with them. But we do have some friends who are, are, are a lot more knowledgeable than mm -hmm. we are, and we'd be happy to connect you. Yeah. And we're always happy to talk more about the, these sorts of topics and anything else. Yes. Um, okay. So we do have a few questions and comments, I believe. Okay. Um, so one is, I see cybersecurity as a three-legged three -legged stool where the control um, MFG must design, manufacturer. oh, manufacturer, uh, must design and develop devices that can be deployed with a cybersecurity mindset. The system integrator then is responsible for installing and deploying systems with a cybersecurity mindset. And finally, the end user and owner must operate and maintain their systems with a cybersecurity mindset. Very well said. So yeah. it's it's not on one person to be cybersecure. It's, it's a whole ecosystem, I guess you could say, yeah. of cybersecurity. Everyone has to be doing their part. Yeah, and the only one thing I would add is in the story of that, that, that seat, mm -hmm. um, creating an, a, an environment where information can be exchanged between all three yeah. uh, at any given time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, good point. Um, another question, remote access is an easy place to point the finger and removing that access can avoid a vulnerability in the minds of large IT departments. Mm -hmm. Are we a few high profile stories away from system integrators having to fight for access to their VAS from outside of the building's attached hardware? Are we integrators making this more likely with poor user management? Whoa, big question. Big question. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. I, I'm surprised yeah. we haven't had more high profile incidents mm -hmm. um, than we have had. Yeah. Uh, everyone talks about Target, and that's eight years ago now. Yes, um, that's true. Right? It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's because there are areas that are more lucrative and more detrimental uh, where cyber attacks are, you know, are, are being focused, and that's yeah. not that's not our buildings or OT systems yet. Yeah. Um, but increasingly, will be, yeah. Yes, but I, I agree with this person. Mm -hmm. uh, remote access is a door, right? It's yeah. creating a door into your fortress. Uh, there are ways to do it right. Mm -hmm. If your customer has a good IT team and they're good to work with, work with them. I mean, that's their job to get, give you access. Uh, uh, it is difficult for them. It's not mm -hmm. easy. It's not an easy task. And if that's not possible, then, you know, there are great products, great tools, mm -hmm. and great methods to create proper um, remote access. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I will say is that the cloud is more secure than on-premise devices. Mm -hmm. So leverage that. It may be a better, uh, for example, uh, leverage things like what we call double firewall. Double, double firewall, mm -hmm. you know, create a firewall into your uh, 
into your uh, system, mm -hmm. going into another system with a second firewall, and then gain access to the second system. Yeah. So that you can protect uh, both, not just not just through one firewall. Yeah. So connect it to the cloud and connect to the, to the cloud, gain access to your system yeah. instead of gaining access directly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a follow up to that question that I think you might have answered: How do you two feel about hardware keys for access to the building of IoT network? Um, there's no right or wrong answer. So when it comes to um, authentication, uh, there are uh, three um, three aspects to authentication. Okay, there's uh, who you are, mm -hmm. what you know, and what you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who you are would be you know, facial recognition, mm -hmm. uh, fingerprinting, uh, iris scan. That's who you are. That's mm -hmm. on on you. Um, what you have would be a key, right? That, that, that's old school key all the way to uh, uh, C VPN key. Yeah. And then what you know, it's password, it's um, you know, the phone that you have for two-step authentication. Yeah. And there's no one that's better than the other. Uh, the, 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 the best one would be to combine all three yeah. together and then use multiple ones of each of them. Um, I think hardware keys have their place. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't use them without additional password basically mm -hmm. as what you have what you know mm -hmm. right to combine what you have with what you know um but it's yeah there's it, it has its place definitely yep. yeah yeah well said um how can we protect against a vulnerability like stuxnet <laughs> uh that's quite old um but great story mm -hmm. um that one i mean two things one is education if, mm -hmm. if I understand it correctly, and this might be rumors, mm -hmm. but it started with the USB key that was left in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So an employee got took took a USB key, brought it into the organization. That's how the worm got into the controller. Gotcha. Um, so that's just that's just straight up education. Yeah. Right? I mean, you could lock down all your USB ports, but yeah, you know, your employees should know not to do that. Yeah, maybe don't plug in a random USB that you find in a parking lot. Yeah. If that is true, just don't do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and second would be some form of monitoring. Right? Yeah. That one would have been quite tough because it was very, very advanced. It was yeah. done very, very well. But basically, if I understand correctly, they modified the program in a controller to change the speed of the centrifuge. Oh, uh, yeah. That basically made the products no longer good. Yeah. Um, but the change was so small that the humans could not identify mm -hmm. it, could not see it. Yeah. That's my understanding of it. Um, I think the first step is education yeah. from the person's side. But technology-wise, I mean, you could have put some kind of monitoring system in place. Yeah. Uh, but the problem with that is that are you monitoring the right thing? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. do you know? Yeah, you might not know what to monitor. For. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think you're right that just having those conversations with your staff, making sure they're educated on cybersecurity, and and again, understand that they're not going to be punished if they bring forward a, a concern or a question about cybersecurity. Having that open dialogue is so so important. Yeah. Uh, one quick thing what we, what, what we do have in our office we have a computer that you know has no information in it uh we use it for you know if we need to borrow a laptop to do some work and, and, and temporarily but that could be something you could leave in your uh, environment mm -hmm. so that your staff your employees can and your your, your partners can use to test things yeah you do find your usb key plug into yeah. that laptop uh it's it's, throw it <laughs> exactly yeah. just make sure it's not connected to the rest yeah. of your your yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, I think we're going to wrap this up. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Uh, please stick around for a quick survey at the end. Um, and if you would like to watch this webinar over and over again, it will be posted to our YouTube channel very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.